I've been writing a DOS program for a while now. I've been using DOSBox, but it would be nice to use real hardware. Ideally, I'd use a period accurate IBM PC, but these are really expensive. Checking eBay, I found an industrial single board computer for $50. The very low price is because its video output is broken. Without video output, this computer is effectively useless. I decided to buy it anyway in hopes of fixing it. So here it is, the PCM9375. It stars a geared LX800 CPU and CS5536 companion chip. 512 megabytes of DDR1 RAM, compact flash for storage, a serial port, an ethernet port, a PS2 port, a VGA port, as well as a mini USB port and a second ethernet port. We're going to remove those for now while we troubleshoot. The first thing I did was hook the board up to a current limited power supply. It pulled a stable load so it's not dead. It made a beep. That's a good sign. I connected a monitor to see what it would display. And... Input not supported. So I checked the power rail with a scope. A major voltage drop could signal that the machine isn't booting properly. I don't see that here. Likewise, no drop at all could mean the machine is dead. I don't see that here either. Everything looks fine power-wise. Bad memory can cause all kinds of issues, so I tried another stick of RAM. Same result. Input not support. I removed the RAM to see if it was being used at all. The BIOS gave these beeps. I removed the BIOS chip to see if it would still beep. It didn't. Next I looked at the clock battery. My multimeter showed it was around 200 millivolts. Completely dead. Perhaps a dead battery corrupted the BIOS settings somehow? Running without the battery didn't help. I wanted to know if the machine was frozen or just waiting for me to do something, so I connected a keyboard to see what would happen. It handled toggling caps lock. It even made noises when I pressed keys. So it must be doing something. Surprise cat visit. This is my brother's ginger cat. While we appreciate the cat, I'd like to talk about the sponsor of this video. Just kidding. I wanted to fill time in the voiceover to show off the cat. Back to troubleshooting. I plugged in an ethernet cable. Maybe if the machine was booting over the network, I'd see some packets. I did see packets, but they were from my machine. Not very helpful. I made an L modem cable on my breadboard out of jumper wires. Probing it showed the serial line was initialized, but it wasn't outputting anything. I lost a few jumper wires doing all this, so it wasn't worth it. At this point, I figured it was time to check the VGA signals. I started with vertical sync. This signal pulses every frame, around 60 times a second. Looking at a single pulse, we can see that it's a 5 volt square wave lasting for around 40 microseconds. The pulse seems to peak around 6.6 .6 volts and takes 230 nanoseconds to settle. This all looks fine to me. Next is horizontal sync. This signal pulses every row of pixels, around 75 kilohertz in our case. Looking closer, we can see the pulse is the same voltage as the vertical sync and it lasts around 1.45 microseconds. The pulse takes 197 nanoseconds to settle high and 307 nanoseconds to settle low. This looks completely fine as well. Okay, red signal? I don't actually see any signal. It just stays around 200 millivolts. Okay, green. Same thing, but it's around 160 millivolts this time. What about blue? It's the same thing as red and green. These all should be much higher. Just to be sure I wasn't missing something obvious, I took a look at the VGA section of the board. I didn't see any visible issues at all. I did try to connect an IDE to SD card adapter so I could boot from it. I managed to power it using a Molex splitter, but the IDE connector on the board was too small to connect it. As an aside, I bought a USB to Molex adapter for powering the board. But it connects the 5V USB pins to the 12V Molex rail. With some work, this is fixable. Step one, use a screwdriver to unlock the pins and pull them out through the back of the connector. 
Step two, bend the side locks on the pins back into shape using a screwdriver. Step three, use the pliers to make the pins round again. Step four, push the pins into the correct sockets. Step five, check that it looks good. I connected the board to a USB power supply as a test. It seemed to boot fine to me. Make sure to use a decent USB power supply. Something that won't explode if you short circuit would be a good idea. Just for fun, I plugged the board into a USB power meter. It verified the system hangs around 1 amp with 1.5 amp peaks. Without any obvious faults, I decided to look at the user manual. It mentions a TV enable jumper, but on my board that just stopped it booting. The VGA section says I need to use the BIOS to configure the video output. The BIOS section says it's configured to use the VGA output by default. The LCD section just shows how to connect a particular display. Let's look at the Geo data book. The VGA display seems to be driven by the video processor block. The video signal is output by an 8-bit digital to analog converter. This converter needs a 1.235 volt reference and a 1.21k ohm current setting resistor. I looked up other schematics online for boards that use the geode. I found the OLPCX01 board. Looking at the schematic, I figure if anything is going to break, it would be the voltage divider used for DV ref. I looked for this divider on my board, which was difficult given it might be broken. I even checked the Realtek Crab logo. Eventually, I didn't find the divider, but I did find a 1.22 volt voltage reference. I made this diagram at the general area for reference. I noticed that most of the signals here are on the outside of the chip. So I set up a makeshift BGA probe on my desk and scoped the available signals. The first DAV DD ball hung around 3.3 volts, which is correct. The second DAV DD ball did about the same. The DV ref ball hung around 1.22 volts, which is about right. The DR set ball was around 40 millivolts, which is a bit high. The VAV DD ball hung around 3.3 volts, which is fine. The dot ref ball had a 3.3 volt 48 megahertz sine wave on it. It should be a square wave, I think, but this might be a scope artifact. Overall, though, everything seems fine. My compact flash card finally arrived. So with the help of a null modem cable, I was able to boot Linux. Specifically Alpine Linux with a custom built kernel with the geode video driver enabled. After a little booting, we get VGA output. It's a wrongly positioned login prompt. Though after a few minutes, it starts to fade. Eventually it fades enough to become invisible. I took a look at the red signal under an oscilloscope. It looked the same as before with no signal, but zooming in shows there's something clearly there. It's just very, very weak. The signal even looks like it's bouncing, but changing the time scale shows it's actually a square wave. A 15 millivolt square wave that runs at 51.58 hertz. Wow. At this point I figured something in the video section of the board was pulling the signal low. So I decided to desolder parts of the circuit to see the signal directly. I ripped a pad desoldering an inductor, so I switched to desoldering the tiny capacitors instead. But I couldn't get the last capacitor desoldered so I desoldered its inductor instead. Probing the unloaded signals showed the same result, so time to solder things back on. Putting the last inductor back was fairly easy, but the capacitors were a different story. I spent too much time trying to get these back into place. Using a webcam as a microscope and a giant soldering tip didn't exactly help. It's also worth noting this was my first experience microsoldering. I was not prepared at all. I gave up putting the capacitors back and tried to remove the last capacitor. Then I started running magnet wire directly to the inductors. This didn't go too well, mainly because I couldn't position the tip correctly. I did manage to get it soldered though and cut to some reasonable length, but soldering the other end of the wire just desoldered the wire. At this point I just had burned flux all over the board. I managed to clean all this up using some isopropyl alcohol and cotton wool tips. I kept trying to solder the wire, but I just didn't have any luck. This is probably because the wire I was using was too big and stiff. Something like wire from a flyback transformer would probably work better. 
Eventually I gave up on the wire and just decided to put the first inductor back. This ended up with me ripping the only other pad I had left. Oh. I decided it was better to quit while I was ahead. And that's all for now. At least I didn't make things functionally worse. See the video description for details left out of the video. If you have any ideas on what to do next, please post them in the comments. Thanks for watching and stick around for the follow up video. Bye.